Now, it was mentioned earlier, you know, that, you know, bladder cancer has been a terrible redheaded stepchild, and thanks to many of the folks in the room and who've already presented before me, and I'm honored to be, uh, you know, on this faculty, we've really gotten to a point right now where bladder cancer is, is the sizzle. It's actually sexy, and it's interesting now, and we can do so much better. But the only way we're going to get there in terms of uh, really doing what's best for the patient, it really does end up with better outcomes, and outcomes uh, are very, very important right now because that's what healthcare is all about. It's all about, you know, creating value, which is outcome divided by cost. So um, we've heard already the importance and the efficacy of radical cystectomy. Uh, what an incredibly, uh, uh, if it were a drug, it would be, you know, rather remarkable. But when the right patient, despite the fact that this is a highly technical, very skilled procedure with a tremendous amount of associated morbidity and even mortality, one can get uh, remarkable survival rates when timed correctly. And uh, it took a while, but you know, sometimes we think of things as, as intuitive, but the data has to be shown. And then, of course, uh, the, 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 the clinical perspective always doesn't match pathological. But when we see pathologically organ confined versus extra vesicle uh, versus um, uh, nodal metastases, is that's where we start to have our issues. And that's where we're now catching up in the field whether it's in chemotherapy or now what we'll hear in, in terms of the immunooncologics. John Stein, uh, great work really demonstrating this uh, before it was really shown, before it was intuitive, but he was one of the first to really show this in this paper in JCO in 2001. So optimizing, I really talked about, even though it says neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we're really thinking more in terms of perioperative chemotherapy and perioperative systemic therapy now, now that we have uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, and that's really where we're driving. I suspect in uh, uh, future uh, IBCUs, we'll, we'll say, wow, it's just, we won't even talk about this nomenclature. We'll just think about combination therapy and better markers to help us get there. But we have limited level one evidence, and then that ultimately should really be our North Star, and that's a lot of the work that you heard already presented by Sam Chang today, uh, today on the non-muscle invasive, and then uh, we look forward to getting the muscle invasive guidelines uh, at the AUA this year. But uh, just as a quick summary, looking at uh, uh, patients who are T2 to T4, perioperative chemotherapy, why give it? We want to improve and eradicate subclinical disease, and we ought to really improve overall survival because we still have patients who succumb to the disease for various reasons, aggressive pathology and other comorbidities. So what are our options? You see them all listed here. I'm a big fan, uh, although my talk is not on it today, on bladder sparing strategies, because despite the literature that we have, it really is one thing to talk about evidence-based literature. It's another thing to sit knee to knee with a patient and tell them you are gonna take their bladder out. Um, you get you know, really deer in the headlights look more than most things that we get in, in, in uro-oncology, and it's a, 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 a for all appropriate reasons. So bladder sparing strategies, if and how we can get there and avoid the morbidity of removing the bladder, that's actually that's clearly one of our holy grails. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy, what are the advantages? Um, the patients are clearly at that time presumably more fit. Um, there's an opportunity to, you know, to see what the original primary tumor is, and ultimately does it correlate with prognostic significance? Will there be predictive biomarkers to better help us? And then ultimately, is there even an opportunity for organ preservation if indeed the patient has a robust response? I mean, these are all things that we have to further investigate. The disadvantages are the oftentimes marked discordances has already been shown today between pathological and clinical staging. It's particularly true in what we think is clinical T2. So selecting patients for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, platinum-based, and that was really the brilliance of the MVAC regimen, was really getting to that. Now we're getting a better understanding. We saw the uh, the conundrum of the P53 trial, but now we're seeing different variants that may be better be, uh, able to inform us regarding platinum-based therapy versus immunologic therapies. I'm sure Dan will talk about that, and whether it's luminal or basal or the particular subtypes within those compartments. But there are certainly patients who don't receive platinum-based therapy, and it, uh, there is a, a many of these patients who have renal impairment or other, uh, whether it's cardiovascular, et cetera, and these are oftentimes elderly patients as 
as uh, Dr. Pinthus has pointed out today, and they have many other comorbidities in addition to the usual smoking alcohol uh, predilections. So poor performance status makes it very, very difficult. And again, one of the more interesting and appealing potential aspects of immuno-oncologics, which have uh, very, uh, for the most part, very well tolerability profiles. So this has already been shown. You've seen this now, and it is to where we stand on the, the, the shoulders of giants before us. And this is a great trial. And there was an international collaboration of trialists who really did show uh, the benefit of getting chemotherapy up front versus uh, no chemotherapy in a large number of patients who underwent cystectomy and showed a 16% reduction in the risk of death with uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a pretty good follow-up uh, uh, duration. And then later on, as you know, David was integrally involved with SWOG, and um, thanks to him and others, look at this, the 8710. You've seen this you know, trial referenced so many times today, and Bart Grossman is first author here, uh, again showing the uh, benefit of uh, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy as well as the downstaging of the tumor. So there really is now level one evidence that patients who do receive it have a, uh, and then ultimately go on to get radical cystectomy, there's an absolute 5% difference in mortality, uh, and there's a, a very significant uh, PT0 as well as a, a downstaging. The problem is, is that a good 60% of patients uh, don't really have benefit from it, and how do we better select these patients? So uh, this also just, continues to show you the, the uh, advantage of uh, the survival benefit and most improvement, especially in patients who were, were great, T3 or greater. So um, you saw the slide earlier. Um, um, I believe um, uh, Seth presented it, I, and I think also um, Sam did as well. Quality of surgery influences bladder cancer outcomes. Well, it seems intuitive. We say that all now, but I can say in the arc of my career, not everybody always thought that or would say that. And now we see that really the best work is done in, quote, high volume centers. And is it Raj Prathi's work that was shown earlier? Does it need to be 25 to 30 uh, uh, a robotic pro uh, cystectomies before you really get your groove? Uh, do you need to do 10 a year? Should you be doing more a year? Is it more than just the surgeon? Is it the entire setup? I would argue that it really is. There's, there's, uh, in addition to the surgeon skill, there really has to be the ent entire operative team and the post-operative care. And the thing that really strikes me is that we're moving into this era that so many of our academic and tertiary center colleagues are being somewhat flooded with many of these patients. And so the, 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 where the rubber will meet the road is the, the issue of, of economics. And uh, we oftentimes don't like to address that, but that will rear itself uh, very uh, uh, dramatically now that we're in this era of the uh, macro transition of volume to value-based care. So going to centers that can do it really well, get patient, great patient outcomes, and do it in a costly way. So why aren't eligible patients receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy? That's a little bit of the challenge here. And what we're seeing is that uh, typically, urologists and, you know, still about 80 to 85 percent of cancer care goes on in the community. Uh, there, you know, and I'll show you some data later on in this presentation that we've made some strides, but it really hasn't been uh, as, as, as high as you would think. So that, what are some of the reasons? Well, there's the risk benefit of, of uh, who will benefit. Some patients will clearly benefit and a significant percentage will not. How do we define better markers and better risk stratification? How do we do better precision medicine, as Dan Theodoresco addressed? Uh, there's the concern about delaying cystectomy, and then, of course, the associated toxicities. And I think a big answer that goes back to the importance of urologists making sure that they're having good multidisciplinary conversation with their medical oncologists as well as shared decision-making with the patient. It sounds glib to say, but we really need to do better at doing that because there are clearly uh, segments of patients who will have uh, excellent responses, regardless of age. So um, one of the problems, too, in, in after radical cystectomy is that there's a potential significant risk for renal function deterioration through either the perioperative experience or obstructive changes. Uh, and therefore, the postoperative reductions could uh, render patients ineligible for therapy that could have been very beneficial in a neoadjuvant setting. But with that said, we have adjuvant chemotherapy that can be administered uh, based upon our pathological stage. If patients PT0, uh, one might be very um, uh, uh, feel that the, it was clear that there could be an opportunity to hold back and avoid 
uh, chemotherapy, and uh, the other advantage is it delays the potential uh, of, for a whole host of reasons, and we're all familiar with them, and delaying scheduling cystectomy. Surgeon schedule, hospital schedule, patient schedule, et cetera, on-toward complications of uh, infections uh, and multiple other uh, life issues. Uh, the disadvantage is, is it's more difficult to deliver uh, a moderately toxic chemotherapy in the post-operative setting and give it the doses that need to be given. Skip that one. Here we go. So, um, but the, the what's the rationale? Well, uh, it is widely used outside of clinical trials, it, the PT34, and for node positive disease. And there are many small studies and anecdotal uh, uh, reviews. And I'm going to show you some really nice work that was published recently by Matt Golsky in, in JCO just a few months ago, um, showing some meta analyses suggesting that it does have an improvement in overall survival. Um, and this could be very appealing as well to surgeons who want to get the, the bladder removed as quickly as possible. So um, the, the advantages is that it's based on further now at, at pathological staging. Uh, you're able to uh, immediately move to cystectomy. The disadvantages is the potential unnecessary exposure to chemotherapy for those who might already be exposed, who are already cured by cystectomy, if they still felt compelled to go with a course of chemotherapy. So there have been a whole bunch of randomized trials of adjuvant therapy. You can see them all listed here. They're relatively, um, you know, most are, were single institution, uh, small numbers. And one of the biggest challenges, and for all of us who are trialists in the audience, this is a, an area that because of the patient population and because of all of the moving parts, it's often very hard to accrue tr patients to these trials. Another reason to uh, really uh, uh, love what the uh, SWAG was able to accomplish, but mo most of these contemporary trials are closed due to poor uh, patient accrual. But this is the paper I was uh, uh, mentioning to you that published this year by Golsky and JCO, and that looking at um, a forest plot meta-analysis of real-world patients who get adjuvant chemotherapy, and it's I apologize that the hazard ratio of the forest plot here, it's a meta-analysis, you probably have a hard time seeing it. But um, looking at age, sex, uh, nodal status, uh, patients uh, overall did, did well in this real-world um, uh, aggregation of all those different trials that we looked at. But it's not level one evidence. So um, some of the conclusions for chemotherapy is combining you know, a cisplatinum-based adjuvant chemotherapy can improve overall survival. Benefit appears to be larger in uh, node-positive patients, but this is a limited data set uh, that could be exaggerating the treatment effect. So neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy decision-making, you've seen slides on this before. It's not completely exhaustive, but it really would be the type of patient who you would say, this should be someone who I would strongly consider uh, who had some of these, if not any one of these particular factors, uh, as well as uh, reasonable uh, performance status and can tolerate uh, upfront four cycles of GEMSYS or MVAC. Um, clinical staging, as I mentioned before, is notoriously inaccurate. We've come to recognize that. I do think in listening to you know, even Sam's um, uh, really great review of all the non-muscle invasive guidelines, even with that and all that hard work that gets done is how often does that uh, really translate and get inculcated into the community. And so much of our staging uh, inaccuracy continues to occur. Uh, and we certainly need to do a better job. So not only with predictive markers for figuring out therapeutics, but uh, newer imaging modalities will uh, uh, hopefully uh, make this um, uh, staging inaccuracy uh, a less of an issue. So uh, <clears throat> neoadjuvant toxicity does not reduce the rates of uh, actual uh, radical cystectomy. Now this is in trial settings, and this was nicely shown in the uh, 8710 SWOG trial, that uh, uh, virtually the same number percentage of patients ended up getting cystectomies, but we know that that's a little bit different in a, a real world sometimes, uh, and that is also some of the taint of that uh, changes, and I think that affects community-based clinicians. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, not all patients are eligible for neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. So um, this is just a, a summary. Uh, it's a little bit detailed. I'll let you sort of read through it, comparing neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. You can get copies of these, which really summarizes it. Um, I do think just a note on the issue for bladder uh, preservation. 
uh, bladder sparing uh, uh, strategies. Uh, I do think that that is something that despite the fact that we can get great results in cystectomy patients um, uh, for the right patient, right time, no doubt that's the standard of care. I would be somewhat provocative and suggest that uh, if we can f do a better job of finding uh, the, the right patients for pr bladder preservation, that that will be a rather a remarkable feat, whether it's in the patients who fail BCG uh, and go on to some sort of uh, uh, PARP or and or immunologic uh, um, uh, new uh, 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 treatment, uh, uh, or uh, is, is it in patients who might even have some uh, aggressive resective radiation adjuvant combination. So some additional summaries of the disadvantages of neoadjuvant as well as the disadvantages of, uh, of adjuvant, which I've already said. So which is, uh, this is NCCN, which is administered and how is it administered? Well, it, you know, first and foremost, level one evidence, neoadjuvant is, gets a higher level of evidence. There are different dose uh, uh, dense regimens for MVAC and, and, and as well as gemcitamine cisplatinum. Oh, interestingly, uh, the medical oncologists know this, you know, these therapies, are, despite the fact that they're all in guidelines, have no um, actual um, formulary approval. And I, I continue to be amazed and, and fascinated by the fact how medical oncologists, most of the, their treatment selection is based on in, in, in non-approved regimens by, uh, from a registrational standpoint. And urologists, we tend to be uh, very doctrinaire about how we use therapies, and I think that that will probably change over time. So optimizing perioperative chemotherapy, um, there is a disconnect between efficacy and effectiveness. Um, the fella on the bottom right is, a, is not a real patient, it's a Hollywood actor, just kidding, that was for the pharma people in the audience. And the actual patient up there, that's actually Crawford, I photoshopped him in there. <laughs> so, so, but we know that unfortunately, you know, efficacy, how an intervention performs in a clinical trial is one thing and then there is ultimately real world and we're, we're all, we all get that, so. Uh, this is just, I mentioned here earlier, just so it starts, you, you see there's about a, uh, a there's a, you know, a, 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 two, a, a two-fold increase in the um, amount or the percentage over the years in neoadjuvant chemotherapy from 10 to 20 percent, while overall, you know, adjuvant chemotherapy has remained somewhat the same. Now, this is 2006-2010 data with all of the advents of uh, newer markers. Uh, with the immuno-oncologics, I do think, uh, I, would, I, would suggest, I would hope that the, the, um, these percentages will change with time. Just to finish up, because this is an international conference, the, uh, this is the uh, European Association of Urology Guidelines on Muscle Invasive and, and Metastatic Bladder Cancer. This is from 2013, their summary radical cystectomy, as you can see. Don't delay, really well-performed lymph node dissection. I, I thought Seth Lerner's presentation was outstanding, and really, I think the data really supports uh, the, the templates that he's addressed. Um, you know, there's ongoing debate about robotics and, and open, but I think the, the writing is on the wall that our training will only have robotic surgeons uh, for in, in, the, uh, in the future. Uh, and then uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy should be considered and clearly discussed as the patient-shared decision-making uh, um, uh, nomenclature that we all have out there. So here's some additionally on who to select for your new adjuvant chemotherapy, not recommended for uh, patients with poor performance status and impaired renal function. And in case of progression, uh, and this is really important, is, is when and how and when will we be thinking about either other chemotherapeutic regimens, but more importantly and more likely, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors. So we have opportunities to improve the effectiveness of perioperative chemotherapy. Um, you know, it, it's not my talk, but it, we, we certainly hear more about these predictive biomarkers and how to better risk stratify barriers to progress. Um, so in conclusion, um, radical cystectomy, extended lymph node dissection is the standard. Currently now, if you're going to be giving any form of chemo, chemotherapy-based treatment, it needs to be platinum-based. Um, surgery quality is an important predictor, no doubt. Uh, uh, and then ultimately, it's really um, the, the predictive biomarkers which will uh, you know, inform us as how, how to best do precision medicine, which is certainly extremely important. It's really important that we have that uh, collaborative relationship that we have here. So we have the level one evidence for platinum-based uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. 
Uh, but most importantly, optimizing the integrative approach, which I think we all have mentors, at least I, I was fortunate enough to work with, with doctors who go to and Vaughn. It should inform many of us about our, our especially any, any younger folks in the room. Thank you.